All right, let us pray. Dear God, our Heavenly Father, thank you for receiving our love and praise. We pray that now that uh, you will open the treasury of heaven. You'll open our mind, open our soul. Let us, while reflecting what Job has done, also reflecting what we are experiencing today. For this is a very important message through which you have opened the possibility of an innocent man suffering, thus paying the sin of the guilty. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. Today we're doing our lesson, um, what, lesson 10, sorry, of the book of Job. Okay. Relating to God while suffering in life. Not an easy work to do. Okay. Uh, lesson 10. Who do you think you are? <laughs> Job 15. <laughs> okay. okay, the road map of the, of the book. First of all, it gave uh, a cosmic picture. Available only for the reader, not for the people in the story. Okay. A righteous man at first was blessed. A good picture. Okay. Pastoral. Okay. All greenery. Okay. And there's no blood, no suffering. Sounds peaceful. Then, a righteous man is suffering. Uh-oh, something is not right. Okay. At least in the idea, in the worldview of a moral universe, this is not right. Okay. An explanation is necessary. So, came the three rounds of debate. We have just finished the first round. Job opened the, uh, the dialogue with his own speech in chapter 3, saying, why should I live? So much suffering, why? Okay. And then his first friend, Eliphaz, gave him a well-rounded argument, you know, considerate and sympathetic, but in the essence, he said, you are punished for sin. Okay. And then Job answered, but where was I wrong? I can't find it. So his second friend, Bildad, uh, said, you must repent if you want to be restored to glory. Okay. And then uh, Job answered, I will argue my face, uh, my, my case, okay, to God. Okay. And so far, his third friend said, you must shut up. And Job said, you are wise, huh? Huh? Yeah. So, okay. Okay. Um, now we're into the second round, okay? In the first round, okay, of the second round, okay, uh, um, Eliphaz said, who do you think you are? <laughs> okay, and that's where we are. Okay. Chapter 15, 1, okay? Then Eliphaz the Temanite responded, should a wise man answer with windy knowledge and fill himself with the east wind? Should he argue with useless talk or with words which are not profitable? Okay. He's basically saying, you're blowing empty hot air. Okay. Because, you know, Eliphaz, he was the statesman-like of the three friends. Okay. He was from Teman, which was in Edom, and uh, he spoke again. Okay. Th but this time he lost his balance and was emotional, at least first. Among these three friends, um, Eliphaz was the one who was more, I said, statesmanlike, more balanced. He was more reasonable, reasonable one. He gives some reasons based on his assumption. Okay. And, uh, and his in his attitude, he was sympathetic and considerate. And uh, uh, his personality is probably, I would say, phlegmatic. The one who wants to balance all relationships, doesn't want to offend anybody. Remember, there are four personalities, right? The choleric are the ones who are willful. What they believe is right must be done. I don't care what you think. Okay, that's choleric. And then you have the sanguine who are emotional. They are people pleasers. They can go this way or that way. Okay? And then you have the, the melancholy who like to be alone and think it through and they don't care about other things. And if you ask him, he, always, he, he doesn't know it all. Okay? And then 
But the phlegmatic are the ones who, who are slow in response. You have to consider everything, balance every relationship. And they're usually the one who's friendly with everybody. Okay? And, and I think, um, you know, Eliphaz, to be fair with him, he was probably a, a phlegmatic personality. He likes to balance everything before he speaks. You know, this is the best man can be, uh, at least at this stage. So uh, when he spoke this time, he got a little irritated by Job's last response. Because Job basically just claimed, hey, you guys claim to be wise. But are you really wise, huh? Because I think you're no wiser than the animals. Because even they can see that my suffering is an act of God. I didn't cause it. But you can't see it. The animals can see it. Okay, that is pretty blunt, right? Uh, and then, you know, uh, Eliphaz got a little hurt. So he, he, he's a little imbalance in the beginning. So basically he says, you are not only a windbag, you're blowing hot air. Okay, and uh, so he said, the true wise man. If you claim to be wise men, like one of us, but are you? You know, true wise men do not blow winds. I mean, speaking empty, meaningless words, uh, definitely not hot air. <laughs> that e that's emotional, dangerous, and blasphemous words, like the east wind from the desert. In Israel, whenever you speak about east wind, that came from Moab, which is from the, 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 the Arabian desert. It's from dry place, and it's hot, and it's going to wither the plants. It does no good. Okay, and he's saying you are blowing hot air, just like the east wind. That, in other words, you know, you're not only windbag saying too much words are meaningless, but your words are bad, uh, and it hurt people. Okay, and <laughs> so, it, and you just gave us useless and unfit, unprofitable talk. Okay, and in addition, he's saying you are close to blasphemy. Okay, verse four. Indeed, you do away with reverence and hinder meditation before God. So Eliphaz regained his statesman-like uh, emotional balance, and he advised Job to regain his fear of God for his own benefit. Okay? He, he's trying to give counsel now. Okay? I'm now giving you advice for your own good. Okay? Don't be blasphemous, which will be bad for you. Okay? So have your fear of God and reverence so that you can restore your meditation before God, okay? And uh, he's saying, your words lacked reverence to God. It will hinder your relationship to him, or at least your fellowship to him, as well as the hearers of your, of your word. Your words, hurting, is hurting, words are hurting yourself and those who hear it. It's hurting us, okay? Please change, okay? For your own good. And what Eliphaz found dangerously close to blasphemy is the challenge to the clock-like, precise, moralistic universe. If the innocent can suffer, then the guilty can get scot-free, and God is not completely just. Reasonable, right? You know, if you have that worldview, you know, the universe is basically deistic. God created the universe, then he let it run like a clock, okay? And then all of the guilty will suffer. All of the good will be rewarded. There's nothing that will go wrong. And then, so it, it's a cold universe, okay? And uh, it's, uh, it's God is holy, just, but not loving and merciful, okay? So it gave us half of God's moral attributes, but ignored the other half, okay? This is the God of Islam, when God is transcendent and supreme and distant, and then humans have no prayer before him, okay? You just live whatever you, wa you live, and then you, you leave to God to judge you at the end. Whatever he gives you, hell or heaven, uh, demons or virgins, it's all up to him, okay? And you have no say. And that's not the God of the Old Testament nor the New Testament. Okay. And, but that's what humans derived from their experience as wisdom in the ancient Near East. Okay. And that's the best the hum humans can do at that time. So this is what Eliphaz thought. Okay. 
uh, he said that uh, the universe is a precise clock, and you are challenging this doctrine, and therefore that is not acceptable. You are close to blasphemy. But we now know that universe is graceless and loveless, without redemption or liberty, and it is performance-based, not relationship-oriented. In that kind of a universe, if the church is like that, you must be holy before you are accepted in the church. You must behave before you are loved. It's performance-based. And it's not grace-based. Yeah, it's a religion, not a relation. Okay. Are many churches actually guilty of that? Are we partly guilty of that? Have we frowned when somebody dressed not like a middle-class American and came into our church and sit in the front row? Would we frown? I think we would. Okay. So be honest with ourselves. Okay. <laughs> okay. And then, Eliphaz goes further. For your guilt teaches your mouth, and your you choose the language of the crafty. Your own mouth condemns you, and not I. And your own lips testify against you. Okay. So he's saying you are crafty, but guilty. Eliphaz admits that Job's arguments are hard to defeat. But... He attributes it to the craftiness of Job's rhetoric, not the soundness of his logic, nor the irrefutability of his evidence. You see, Job is claiming on the authority of his experience. He is suffering greatly, and it does not match any sin that he could find in his life. He's not claiming to be sinless, but he's can't find anything that matches the punishment. And it does not, it, it, can, it, it is not explainable in the clock-like universe, moral universe worldview. Okay? So his argument is based on his experience, which no one can refute. You see, you can never refute somebody's experience. He experienced it, that's real to him. What you can refute is a logic or presupposition, right? Y you can say, well, your, your assumption is wrong or your logic is wrong. But if both are right, then the experience would definitely lead to the conclusion. Okay, so um, Eliphaz could not refute the logic. Um, he could not refute the, the experience, but he will not admit that the assumption is wrong. So he just said, well, you're crafty, but you are uh, definitely guilty. Okay. And he says that the Job condemns himself by opening his mouth. So whatever you say, we only condemn yourself. When arguments fail, the convenient way is to do ad hominis attack. Okay. And when the fundamentals are challenged, it is a must to shut down the discussion. Is that what's happening now? Yeah, when arguments can't be won, they shut down the discussion, okay? They attack your motive, they attack your being, okay? And then everything you say condemns you, okay? You belong to the 1% that do not deserve to live, okay? I've heard that a lot in the communist China. I thought I escaped communism, but unfortunately it followed me to America. Where, <laughs> sadly speaking, yeah, yeah, <laughs> it's not a joke. It's actually very sad. And, uh, and then Eliphaz continues to question, where is your authority from? Okay. In verse 7, were you the first man to be born or were you brought forth before the hills? Do you hear the secret counsel of God and limit wisdom? yourself. You see, tradition was the greatest authority from the ancient Near East to the Jews of modern times. Okay. 
Uh, do you remember Tevye? You know, tradition, okay. No? And what is that? Uh, Fiddlers on the Roof, okay. Yeah. Great show. Okay. Uh, loved it, okay. And uh, yeah, tradition was the highest authority. What the Jews, where did the Jews get their tradition for how to live? Well, they, they have rabbis. What did the rabbi get their tradition? Uh, from the previous rabbi. And they would go on generations through the Talmud and to the Mishnah, which was written by the so-called sages of the first two centuri centuries of our, of our era, okay? The first two Christian centuries, okay? Uh, from, let's say, quote unquote, zero, there's no zero, from, from one to 200, during that time, okay? And then those rabbis, they claim that they are on the seat of Moses because they possess the so-called oral law, which was passed on, according to them, orally, parallel to the written law. It started from the same time given by God through Moses, but Moses only wrote down a part which was given to the common people, and then another part which was given only to the initiated, it was orally passed down to the wise and godly. And therefore, the oral law is not only equal, but more equal than the written law, okay? So they have authority. And not only the, they have authority to reform the, more, the, the laws of Moses by a majority vote, okay? They also leave precedence by what they do. And whatever they do will be a good example to follow, okay? And the same thing goes on later to Islam. Think about it. Islam actually is nothing but a Judaism for Gentiles. Okay? And um, it follows the selected law of the Old Testament, and uh, it has reformed by majority. What is Sunni? The majority. Okay? And then what is the, uh, the precedent? Whatever Muhammad did, allegedly, okay, is what we can do. You see, that's, so what is Jewish is also Islamic now, okay. And then, um, so, according to Eliphaz, for one's word to have authority, he either is in the position of such or quotes from such a person, okay. You see, the first two centuries sages were in the position of authority. And later Jews quote from them. And either way, they have authority. Okay? So Eliphaz used the same thought. He's asking Job, where did you get authority? Okay? Eliphaz questioned whether Job was in such a position of authority, like being so close to God, either as the first created man or a prophet who hears secret counsel of God. Well, of course, Job is not Adam. And Job didn't even claim to be a prophet who hears from God. So Eliphaz says, you have no authority, all right? And since you have none, why don't you listen to the majority, which is us? So why are you so arrogant and not listening? Verse 9, what do you know that we do not know? What do you understand that we do not? Both the gray-haired and the aged are among us, older than your father. Okay, so Job claimed that he knows what his friends knows, but experienced more than can be experienced. Okay. But since Job fought fire with fire, Eliphaz is doing the same back. He claimed that Job does not have anything more than all the friends here, especially when the friends are older than Job. You see? Job claims that I believed in the same moralist universe as you did. So I know just as much as you know. And I have something more. I have an experience, which you don't. Okay? And uh, uh, so he, that's his fight, fighting fire with fire, <laughs> claiming authority. And then Eliphaz is fighting back, doing the same. Say, you have no authority. Okay? And then he, he says, uh, we have something more than you. Okay? We have a majority. And then we also have more age, okay? 
according to ancient ideas, wisdom came from life experience. If you are more aged, the white hairs are more respected in ancient times. And these days, they love to be youthful, but <laughs> it's totally opposite, right? But in ancient times, the white hairs are respected because we believe they have wisdom just by being seasoned in life, right? So he's saying, we have people, either all of them or some of them among the three, older than your father, maybe himself, okay? And how can that be real? Well, if we give some credence and trust to the rabbis, okay, uh, who did the Seder Olam, which is the biblical chronology, okay, uh, they wrote that book in about circa 150, okay, A.D. And uh, Seder Olam is Jewish biblical chronology, okay, and then they believe that Israel stayed in Egypt for only 210 years, a short sojourn, and they believe that Job lived exactly during that time, 210 years. How do we know that? Well, Job lived 140 years after he was restored, according to the Bible, all right? And then the Bible also said that Job was blessed by God at that time, so he had twice as much as he had before, okay? And then you extend it to the eight, to the years, they would say, well, he lived 70 years before the event and 140 years later, and totally 210, which fits exactly into 200 years of Israel in Egypt. Well, that's not nece necessary, but on the other hand, it's a reasonable projection. Okay, well, let's take that, okay? Because tradition also says J Moses wrote Job, all right? How could he write Job if Job was as old as Abraham, right? Job must be sometime have a little overlap at least. If that 210 years overlaps with Moses, 80 years, we know that 40 years, for 40 years, Moses was a prince of Egypt, during which he probably received the tradition, oral traditions of Genesis, and have edited that. And then in the latter 40 years, he was in Midian, in, in the desert, in Arabian desert, which is adjacent to Moab, where Job was from. And it could be that he had heard of, maybe he actually went and saw Job, and either he received and edited, or actually wrote all, right? So now it's all possible. Therefore, I do accept this rabbinical tradition, although I have you know, a lot of doubts about rabbinical teaching because of the theology, but this, yeah, it, it's pretty good. Let's take that. Is it possible at this time that Job was, let's say, 70 years old? Is it possible for these friends to be older than his father? Well, this is the time of, well, of m Joseph. How old did Joseph live? 110, right? So it's, it's possible for these people who are about 100 years old, which would be older than Job's father, right? So Eliphaz was not lying. He's not boasting. He's saying something factual. He, he's just saying, hey, because of our age, we, we have more wisdom than you, okay? Especially when we also have a majority, and that's how we determine what is the wisest, you know, opinion. So why don't you listen? Why are you so arrogant? Okay. Then he goes to feeling. You disappointed and hurt. Verse 11. Are the consolations of God too small for you? Even the word spoken gently with you? Why does your heart carry you away? And why do your eyes flash that you should turn your spirit against God and allow such words to go out? Eliphaz claimed that he and the other friends here have brought consolations of God to Job and spoke gently to him. And Eliphaz indeed appeared considerate in his first speech, right? If you read this, okay? So Eliphaz asked Job why he was not grateful, but angry, not listening, but speaking. His attitude hurts the feelings of his friends who are devoted to hold Job within the orthodoxy. We're trying to help you. Why are you angry with us? Okay, take it. You hurt our feelings. Okay. And then he starts to give his advice. Okay. The first is admit your sin. Verse 14. What is man that he should be pure? Or he should he is who is born of a woman that he should be righteous. Okay. 
here, Eliphaz declares what seemed to be an undeniable truth, that no humans born of a woman are sinless. That means 100% pure and righteous before God. True? Yeah, true. Most of us would. Yeah, true. Yeah, that's what Paul said that. Right? And uh, so, however, be careful. This is a trap. Like the serpent, did God really say that God must not, e that you must not eat from any tree of the garden? Did God really say that? He didn't. So the answer is easy. No. So did you know Eve say? No. And then, but what happens when you start your dialogue with the the serpent, with demon, with Satan? Well, he's gonna go further and lead you into error, right? So just don't talk to him, all right? Cut it off. And so watch out. This is a trap. It's something that seems to be irrefutable. But the statement is not totally true for Adam before the fall, nor for Jesus Christ, the God-man. You see, there are exceptions to the statement. Yeah. No man born of a woman can be 100% pure before God. Not true for Jesus Christ. He was born of a woman but not of man. He was the only one such. Born of a woman, but not of a man. Okay, Conceived by the Holy Spirit. Therefore, he carried no sinful nature, and he did not sin. Okay, Because of that, his voluntary death pays for the sins of others, that is, of all. Okay, So, uh, and also, Adam, he was not born of a woman. He was created by God directly. And when God created him, he was sinless. And he carried no sinful nature. He gained that after he sinned. Okay? So for Adam, what happened was epigenetic, while everyone born from Adam was genetic. Okay? We who are born of Adam, we inherited the something in our genetics, I in our genes. It's a sinful nature. But for Adam, he didn't have it. He gained it. It was written into him after he sinned. Okay, that's epigenetics. For most of us, epigenetics is always minor. Most of our things are genetic. Okay, and but for Adam, that was major. Okay, so this statement is not totally true. It has exceptions, and the statement also denies the possibility of one righteous man who does not carry sin, thus can be the redeemer of many. You see, if the door is closed for a righteous man suffers, then there is no possibility of redemption by Jesus Christ. You see how important this is? This chapter, essential for whole biblical theology. So, not only Eliphaz wants Job to admit his sin, which is easy to admit, all of us will be easy to say that, but he wants him to admit his guilt, okay, specifically for this suffering. Okay, verse 15. Behold, he puts no trust in his own holy one, and the heavens are not pure in his sight. How much less one who is detestable and corrupt, man who drinks iniquity like water. You see, Eliphaz's trap is to lead Job from admitting sin in general to admitting guilt to the uh, for the cause of his disaster specifically. He's saying that humans who are born with sinful nature naturally sin. True. And unrepentant sinners grow bolder every time he is not caught. True. Okay. And he would question the purity of God and heaven, thinking that the ideal of righteousness is never real. Then he will go deeper into depravity and corruption, thinking it's a norm of life. True. True. Right? So if people have sinned and they have thought, okay, everybody sins on earth, maybe it's so in heaven. So isn't this actually the reality, sort of, or the made-up reality of the pagan pantheon? Think about Olympus, the gods in Olympus. What is Zeus? A womanizer, okay? What about the other gods, Athena, you know, Apollos? And they, they are vengeful. Okay, and uh, and uh, Aphrodite, promiscuous. Okay, so all of human sins have been projected up into the gods, 
Okay? And since that's the ultimate reality, and therefore to sin is the norm of life. It's just something, it's the way things are. Remember the mouse in, what is that? Uh, babe. <laughs> if you have children, you see children's movies, okay? Yeah, the little mouse. The way things are. Okay, yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, so once you think that's the way things are, then you have no choice. It's natural. You know, there's, it's no guilt for sinning, and then just keep on sinning. That's exactly what Satan wants us to do, to admit that we're guilty for everything. And then, therefore, you have no hope. Just continue on sinning then. Okay? And then le let us re recognize there's a limited range of doctrine. Okay? Eliphaz's words sounds like Paul's in Romans 3 and the Calvinistic doctrine of total depravity. Remember in Romans 3, 10 to 12, there is none righteous, not even one. There's none who understands. There's none who seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become useless. There is none who does good. There's not even one. Ouch. It hurts. But is it true? Yes, it is true. This is de describing natural man. Okay, without God, without being born again, without the Holy Spirit, this is what we are. Okay, it is true. Okay? And the doctrine of total depravity, it means the corruption or darkening of the imago Dei, the, the image of God, in all of the faculties of man's soul. That is mind, your reason, heart, your emotion, will, your volition, conscience, your uh, ability to judge evil and good, and strength, your ability to carry out your decision. Okay? All of them have been corrupted. Not even one is uncorrupted. So in other words, that includes the one's free will. Even today, we may still use the term free will, but a sinner's free will is not free. Totally, it is under bondage. Martin Luther actually wrote a book called The Bondage of the Will. Sinners sin. That's what they are. Okay? You cannot save yourself. Even if you want to, you cannot. Not to say most people don't want to. So you can only be saved by an external force, by one who has no sin yet powerful enough to conquer sin and death, and that is Christ Jesus. That's the, our doctrine of salvation by faith alone, grace alone, and Christ alone, right? The, the proud five alones uh, of, the, uh, of the Reformation. So uh, <laughs> depravity, total depravity, okay, is talking about the, the loss of the free will, the real free will, okay? And uh, uh, it is taken captive by the sinful nature. These are all correct. I believe these are all correct. However, these doctrines are limited for the natural man. It does not exclude pre-fall Adam, who was not a natural man. He was supernaturally made, all right? And it does not exclude the God-man, Jesus, who is both God and man. The two coincide together. He's 100% God and 100% man, okay? And he has no sinful nature conceived by uh, the Holy Spirit through a virgin, Mary. So, this does not include them, neither does it include highly sanctified believers who are not sinless yet, but guilt-free already. Think about this. Okay. Can we reach a state of sanctification? When, whenever we had a sin, we quickly recognize and we confess, and then the guilt goes away. So that Let's say 90% of your life, 99% of your life is guilt-free. Can we reach that? Yes, it, we can. That is called sanctification. That is the near perfect, but not yet perfect. Okay? And it's possible. It is our desire of life to live such a life. We don't want to live with guilt. So whenever you have a guilt, deal with it. Repent. Change. And then live guilt-free. It is possible for us, okay? We can die without regret. That is our goal for believers, and we can. To say that is impossible is denying the greatest blessing of Jesus.
Jesus Christ for his believers, for his bride. Okay? So even though I recognize, okay, Calvinistic doctrine for salvation, I believe that's biblical. But if you go overboard to saying that we, for all the time, we are as bad as can be, and you might as well just let it go and trust in God for whatever comes, then you have become a Muslim, not a Christian. Okay. A Christian is freed from the concept of the sin by the act of Jesus and our simple faith. And then we can live a life guilt-free, and we can die without regret. That's our goal, okay? And then don't ever depart from that hope, which will remove you from the effort, okay? And now let's continue. He said, I'm going to give you a, a picture of the wicked people, which I saw in my dream, okay? But, and this is a tradition from the most pristine past, therefore the purest doctrine. Verse 17, I will tell you, listen to me, and what I have seen I will also declare. What wise men have told and have not concealed from their fathers, to whom alone the land was given, and no alien passed among them. Eliphaz will tell what he had seen, perhaps in the dream he mentioned in the first speech, in 4, 12 to 21. It's kind of a spooky uh, picture, and his, their spirit has passed through him, and his, all the hair of his body stood up, you know and he saw some images and this may be what he saw okay and then he says it is what wise men have passed on throughout many generations a tradition from the most ancient thus the purest doctrine he said this is a picture of the wicked near his end okay the wicked man writhes writes <laughs> writes in pain all his days and numbered are the years stored up to the ruthless. Sounds of terror are in his ears, while at peace the destroyer comes upon him. He does not believe that he will return from darkness, and he is destined from the sword. So Eliphaz saw a wicked man and ruthless man near the end of his life, writhing on bed in pain like a woman in her birth pain. Remember, Job was, in a sense, writhing in pain. I don't know if he could move because he said he was like a what? puddle of pus in a crust of dust. Every move hurt. Okay. But this is similar. Um, and he experienced sudden disaster when he is least expecting. So that's exactly what happened to Job and his children. Sudden disaster when you least expect it. And terror seized him, for he knows that he's going into darkness. That's what Job was feeling. He thought he's going to Sheol, where there's no light and no motion. And then he got what he deserved. Verse 23. He wanders about for food, saying, where is it? He knows that a day of darkness is at hand. Distress and anguish terrify him. The over, they overpower him like a king ready for the attack. Because he had stretched out his hand against God and conducted himself arrogantly against the Almighty. Okay. The wicked man will experience hunger, fear, distress, anguish, and the pain of feeling powerless and insignificant. That's exactly what Job felt. Okay. And he got what he deserved since he arrogantly behaved toward God and his messengers like the friends of God. And then he was foolish and unrealistic. Okay. He rushes headlong toward him with his massive shield, for he has covered his face with his fat and made his thighs heavy with flesh. The wicked man challenged God headlong, falsely trusting in his human shield, that is, is self-justification and self-righteousness. But in fact, his shield is nothing but fats on the face and thighs from the wealth unrighteously accumulated. The arrogance and foolishness of the wicked is so similar to a character of Job's challenge to God by claiming righteous when the evidence and logic points to guilt. So thought Eliphaz. 
and his fate is determined. Verse 28. He has lived in desolate cities in houses no one would inhabit, which are destined to become ruins. He will not become rich, nor will his wealth endure, and his grain will not bend toward the ground. He will not escape from darkness. The flame will wither his shoots, and by the breath of his mouth he will go away. The end of the wicked is destitution, proper, uh, poverty, childlessness, and the condemnation by his own words, all currently experienced by Job. And his empty words reap emptiness. Verse 31. Let him not trust in emptiness, deceiving himself, for emptiness will be his reward. It will be accomplished before his time, and his palm branch will not be green. He spoke empty words and will reap emptiness, just like Job spoke empty words. And dot, dot, dot. He will die before his time for being overly wicked, not overly righteous, like fruits falling to the ground before the season. We know there is a controversial sentence in Ecclesiastes 7, 16 to 17. Do not be excessively righteous and do not be overly wise. Why should you ruin yourself? Do not be excessively wicked and do not be a fool. Why should you die before your time? In other words, you can be excessively righteous or excessively wicked, both resulting being destroyed before your time. Okay? How, about how can you be excessively righteous? Shouldn't we be try to be 100%? Yeah, to yourself. But in the application, there may be a matter of timing or procedure. And if you do not consider that, it might backfire, right? So, uh, <laughs> for example, I'm going to take the exam in BTS in, let's say, two weeks. But I disagree with their policy of strict masking for everyone, no, with no exception. I wrote a letter to the president of the seminary saying, please allow exemptions for the age, health, or religious reasons, because that is what is legal and constitutional. There's no response. And I also wrote to the one who administered the, ex the, the exam saying, if I claim, I'm not saying I definitely will, I'm just saying if I claim exemption due to religious reasons, Will you still deal with me? Uh, can we deal with under the door or off campus? Because there's, there's just a you know, jack in the box right beside campus. And I can do it there and hand it back to you and under the door. And I haven't responded. <laughs> so in a sense, I might have become overly righteous and I might kill my desire for a PhD. I don't think, because I'm not demanding, I'm trying to work it out, but it's po 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 possible. Okay, I hope you recognize, you know, you're trying to do the right thing, stick to your belief and doctrines, and then while trying to be a peacemaker and work things out. But sometimes, you know, it's not understood, and uh, things happen. So, yeah, it's possible to die before your time or be destroyed, <laughs> your dream or so, destroyed in my case. Uh, before your time. Uh, and of course, if you're overtly wicked, you could be destroyed before your time, definitely. Okay? Uh, it's a drunken drive. Okay? Uh, whatever. He's saying, this guy would die before his time, and uh, you are kind of like him. And he says, he does not live a full, fulfilled life. Okay, 33. He will drop off his unripe grapes like the vine and will cast off his flower like the olive tree. For the company of the godless is barren and the fire consumes the tents of the corrupt. The, his untimely death will result in a sense uh, of unfulfilled regret like fruits falling before the season is an unfulfilled existence. You know, Babe basically said, the pig, we are, we exist to be eaten. What kind of meaning of life is it? You know, Babe questioned, if pigs can think, okay. 
<laughs> but anyway, anyway, it was fulfillment of some purpose of life. But if you die before your time, you're going to feel unfulfilled. Okay? This is the law of moral universe. The wicked will suffer and end up unfulfilled and empty, while the righteous will be blessed and full of meaning of fulfillment. There is no exception. But remember, in that universe, there is no Christ and no redemption. It's too cold. Okay. In the final verse, this is what they are. The way things are. Okay. 35. They conceived themselves in mischief, and they conceive mischief and bring forth uh, iniquity, and their mind prepares deception. Okay. The wicked are born wicked. They think and live wickedly, and they die the death predestined for their wickedness. Okay. But you, Job, are experiencing the end of the wicked. So are you still claiming to be righteous? This is the, the logic, okay? This is what I saw, what happens to the wicked. You are experiencing their experience. So does that imply that you are actually wicked? I mean, he didn't say it directly. He's implying it in almost every sentence, right? And then in the worldview of the deist moralistic universe, there will be no forgiveness or redemption, no liberty from sin, no hope of holiness, and love in eternal life. Do you really want that universe? Or do you want the one with exception and with the other half of God's moral attributes in action? Remember, God is both holy and just. He is also loving and merciful. He is both. If you only see half, that's partial truth. But man, it hurts and it's hopeless. And we're so glad we see the whole because Jesus came, okay? And Job was written, which opens the door for Jesus. Remember, I'm going to quote the illustration he just taught me yesterday. Jesus catches the fish before cleaning it. We are saved before we are sanctified, right? So do we want to clean the fish before catching it? Will our church be grace-based or performance-based? Is salvation first or sanctification first? I hope you know the answer. Okay. Both are important. Salvation and sanctification. Okay. Grace and holiness. They're both, they're all important. But you must know which is first. Salvation is first by an external force. Sanctification is later by us cooperating with the Holy Spirit who lives in us forever. Heavenly Father, thank you for giving us this very important chapter which opens the gate for the redemption in Christ Jesus in a righteous man's suffering. We are living in a time when the righteous do suffer, not for the sake of their own sin, but for the sake of others. We know we are suffering for the sin of Adam. So we get sick, we get old, and we die. We accepted that. We have overcome that in Christ Jesus by the promised resurrection. But there are also the evil people who try to, let's say, reduce the world population to 10%. And with that, we came things like COVID and then all of those things. And I don't believe we're suffering for our own sin on that. We are the righteous who are suffering like Job experienced. We know this is a loud, open possibility because we know it has opened the door for Jesus Christ, the sinless who suffered voluntarily and died to redeem the guilty. And in him, we can live, though not sinless yet, but guilt-free. And we pray that we live that life to be not only saved, but also sanctified, not only receiving grace, but also living grace, giving grace, not only saved by grace, but also try to perform, to perform, not to be saved, but 
to please the one who saved him and loved us with all that he had given. We pray that this valley will become the reality of our life, of this church, and all of the universal church. I pray in Jesus Christ's holy name.